We're going to start out in Isaiah 53. I'm going to deal with this subject here tonight. Jesus, our penal substitution. This is an important subject. I read an article last month, uh, earlier before the last Lord's Supper, and I was thinking about dealing with some of these thoughts here at the last uh, Lord's Supper, but then I, I just didn't go with it. And, and I sort of just pushed it aside. But then something hit me this past week. There was a false teaching that crossed my desk that says that God forgiving our sins has nothing to do with the death of his son. That God can forgive without the death of his son. This particular false teacher was arguing that Christ's death removed sin so that believers no longer have sin, but it has nothing to do with forgiveness. It only deals with the removal of sin so that if you believe in Christ, your sin has, is gone. In other words, you don't, you don't sin because the sin is gone. That's what happened at the cross. What had nothing to do with forgiveness. So that Jesus' death on the cross had nothing to do with bearing the punishment for our sins. We just sang about that. The, the, some of those songs were essentially quoting scripture, actually. Jesus was not dying as a substitute for guilty sinners who deserved to be condemned. Of course, to say that God can justly forgive without the death of Christ is to ignore the fact that the only way that God can remain just and also forgive is if his justice is satisfied. That's what Romans 3, 24 and 25 teach us. He cannot justly forgive simply on the basis of mercy. Islam teaches that. that if, there is, if God forgives, it's on the basis of mercy. And they have to wait till the end to see if they fall under the mercy of God. And they do the best they can during this life in order to hopefully fall under the mercy of God. And so there is this, the theological expression, penal, P-E-N-A-L, the penal system. It's a judicial, legally punishable, judicial penalty. That's the idea in the word penal substitution. It is the theological expression that says Jesus took the place of condemned sinners on the cross so that punishment demanded by the law of God or demanded by God under his law was placed upon Jesus Christ on behalf of those for whom he died. There is mystery in the cross. We may not be able to explain all the details of how the death of Jesus Christ accomplished what it accomplished. And I think it's best that we stay away from trying to do too much philosophical explaining of how it does what it does. We know by faith that his death for us secured the remission of our sins. We believe that. The guilt is gone, and one eternal day, sin will never again touch us. And so the hymn writer says, "'Tis mystery all the immortal dies." Who can explore his strange design? In vain the firstborn seraph tries to sound the depths of love divine. J.I. Packer says one thing that Christians know by faith is that they know only in part. And if you're not satisfied with that, you'll never be satisfied. In fact, it'll pretty much wear you out if you cannot live by faith, believing, simply believing what God says. But the Word of God then clearly announces the penal substitution of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was justly due to me as a penalty for my sin in Adam? Do you hear that? What was what I deserved in Adam? In Adam, our, the head of the human race, God judging the human race in Adam. 
For by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all sinned. That verb there, all sin, points to one point in time. It's not that all keep on sinning, that's true, but that's not what that verse is saying. So that you continue reading in Romans 5, 12 through 19, and you see the repetition of the word one, one, one. One man, one man, one man. One Adam, one Christ, one man. The first Adam, the second Adam. And so our sin in Adam was our sin. We participated with him in that. And then my own sin, God laid upon his only begotten son, our plural sins. So Isaiah 53, repeatedly this is expressed. Surely, verse 4, Surely, He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. In other words, we... We esteem that he was getting this from the hand of God because he deserved it. But the truth is, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. For each one of us have turned to our, to our own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken for for the transgression not for his own for ours verse 10 yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him many translations say crush him which is a proper translation as well bruise and crush are proper translations of that Hebrew word he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Galatians 3. Just reading several scriptures which make it clear that Jesus gave his life. He died in the place of guilty sinners, taking our sin upon him. That is exactly what he did on the cross. That's exactly what he bore on the cross. Don't tell me it had nothing to do with bearing our sins and our forgiveness and the remission of our sins. Don't tell me that. That's, that's a lie. The scriptures tell us quite the contrary. Galatians 3, in verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for, on our behalf, for us, in the place of, for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. 2 Corinthians 5. And 
and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for same preposition as before. And I'm saying that there's a lot of F.O.R.s in the scriptures. They're not all this same preposition. If you could see the original, you'd know what I'm talking about. This is a preposition that is talking about in the, in the place of. For them. And rose again, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. 1 Peter 3. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. How can anyone read the Bible and say that the death of Jesus Christ was not necessary for God to forgive? For God to put away that which separated us from God in order to bring us to himself. It required the death of Christ. First Timothy. First Timothy two. Five and six, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. To be testified in due time. Gave himself a ransom for. Gave himself a ransom describes the nature of what the man Christ Jesus did in order to be the one mediator between God and men. In other words, he substituted himself as payment in exchange for the freedom of sinners who were under judgment. What Christ Jesus did completely satisfied the curse that was upon all those for whom he substituted himself. This was a fully satisfactory ransom paid in full. Think about that as you take the elements tonight. Paid in full. I've been ransomed. I've been redeemed. My sins are not held against me. My guilt is not hanging over me. Somebody mentioned to me uh, this morning one of the difficulties. Why is it that I wake up in the morning and, and I, the first thing that I struggle with is my... Is, is what I'm not doing. The first thing I struggle with is how short I come. The first thing I struggle with is that I, I don't have that desire that I should have. That's the first thing I struggle with. Brethren, really, we, the first thing we ought to wake to in, this, in the morning is paid in full. I, I'm, I'm ransomed. The one who is at the right hand of the Father, is substituted Himself for me so that I do not have to face that penalty that I otherwise would have been facing and should face, and justly so. No more. So that on the cross, Jesus Christ was actually bearing the punishment due to those for whom he died. He was actually doing something there on the cross. On the cross, God was demonstrating his love through the penal substitution of his son. That's why, that's why this is so important. We can't lose sight of what was really going on there on the cross. The father was not 
bullying his son on the cross, the father and son were unified in this cross work. The outworking of the everlasting covenant. So that the son willingly was doing what he was doing as the father Pleased him? Isn't that what Isaiah said? It pleased him to bruise, to crush his son upon the cross, to pour out his wrath upon his own son. Talk about a mystery. Talk about you got to shake your head over that one. Faith receives what Jesus Christ has done for us, even though we don't fully comprehend. I, I want to read nine statements here that J.I. Packer wrote out. And he wrote them out. These are conclusions that he drew after working through this article on penal substitution. And if you're interested in reading it, I'll, I'll, I'll get the address to you. But listen to these statements. Number one, God condones nothing but judges all sin as it deserves, which Scripture affirms and my conscience affirms to be right. Number two, my sins merit ultimate penal suffering and rejection from God's presence. Conscience also confirms this, and nothing I do can blot them out. Following this? Number three. The penalty due to me for my sins, whatever it was, was paid for me by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in His death, on the cross. Number four. Because this is so. I through faith in him. And made the righteousness of God in him. That is I am justified. Pardon. Acceptance. And sonship become mine. This can almost get you a little excited. Number five. Christ's death for me is my sole ground of hope before God. This is not just a religious ceremony tonight. I, I'm reacting in that statement to something that I was told this morning. That's not what this is. It's not a, a man-made thing. This is, a, this is something that God has told us to do that we might be brought face to face with the death of His Son and what His Son has accomplished for us. If it is just a ritual, then please leave the place right now. That's all it is. I digress from the list here. Number five, Christ's death for me is my sole ground of hope before God. If he fulfilled not justice, I must. If he underwent not wrath, I must to eternity. Number six, my faith in Christ is God's own gift to me. Given in virtue of Christ's death for me. That is, the cross procured it. You, you understand the cross bought everything? Not only the ground of your forgiveness, but the very faith that you have purchased by Christ. Everything. Seven, Christ's death and resurrection for me guarantees my preservation to glory. 
Christ's death and resurrection for me guarantees my preservation to glory. Number eight, Christ's death for me is the measure and pledge of the love of the Father and Son to me. Christ's death for me is the measure and pledge of the love of the Father and the Son to me. Number nine, Christ's death for me calls and constrains me to trust, to worship, to love, and to serve. When penal substitution is not central in our gospel understanding, we will shift attention to ourselves. We will shift attention to man. We will be thinking about what we do. We'll be thinking about our response. We'll be thinking about our devotion. Adding to the finished work of Jesus to overcome the guilt of our sins. If we do not receive Jesus Christ by faith, we will stumble over that rock. Stritten, stricken, smitten, and afflicted on behalf or in the place of me and you. We won't view the glory of Christ. We will stumble over Christ. Just like the Jews did. Since Jesus was a penal substitute for individuals, those individuals cannot face divine retribution because that's already fully satisfied at the cross. Before the judgment throne of God, your defender pleads your case right now and justice is satisfied he is not a slick lawyer deceiving or conniving a reduced sentence your guilt is not hidden from the court Your lawyer has taken your place. This is penal substitution. And the Lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. And understandably so. I want to close by reading Romans 8. This is who we're remembering tonight. We've got to get our hearts set upon Him. Most of the problems we face, most of the problems we deal with in our lives on a practical level, whether it's relational or personal or struggles internally, can be tracked right here. We are not seeing and savoring Jesus Christ in the way that we should. Romans 8, 32. He... They spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Tonight, as we take these elements, would you dwell upon that reality? That one who died rose again is interceding this very moment.
for you and me who are believers in him.